So buying a new camera can be a confusing and somewhat daunting experience sometimes. There's a lot of different manufacturers to choose from. There's a lot of different bodies to choose from. There's a lot of different lenses that go on those bodies. There's a lot of different functions and features and all this kind of stuff that needs figuring out before we decide where to spend our hard earned money. And so that's what this video is about. It's about demystifying these classes of things so that we know that wherever we're putting our money, it will go the longest amount of distance for our photography journey. So the way I'll be suggesting these tools is from the most most accessible to the least accessible based on both budget and complexity. And the first thing that I'm going to suggest is actually not even a dedicated camera at all, surprisingly enough. It is actually your smartphone. Now, before you write this advice off, just hear me out for a second. Now, the thing with cameras in general is that the best camera is the one that you have on you at any given time, and you always have your phone on you. Phone cameras these days are getting really, really good. And not only that, there are a whole bunch of phone only photographers out there these days that are doing incredible, incredible things. So it's definitely not something that should be looked at lightly. I still take the most amount of photos on my smartphone than any other one of these cameras that I own, just in total. I always use my smartphone and you can do some amazing things on it. The main reason that I actually love recommending smartphones is because it takes the complexity out of shooting photos just completely. It's so, so straightforward, so easy to shoot photos on a phone. It is literally point and shoot. That is really important, especially in your first couple of years of photography, because the most important skill to learn is your vision, is your composition, is what is actually in the photo rather than the device that you're taking your photo with. You can put a smartphone in the hands of a professional photographer and you will get professional quality results. That's just how it works. Especially these days, the potential of how far you can take your smartphone shots has been increased exponentially. Now there are companies like Moment, for example, that sell lenses that you can put onto the backs of your phones for things like macro or anamorphic effects or a whole bunch of other different things. So definitely don't sleep on your smartphone. These, these devices are truly powerful and can really help your photography. Now, the next piece of kit that I'll suggest is actually a compact camera. So if you know me and my work, you'll know that I love compact cameras, especially the Sony RX line of cameras. These are some of my favorite cameras ever. I've owned every single one for the last four or five years, and I never leave home without it. There are so many reasons why I absolutely adore these cameras. And the first is that the quality of them is so high, it more than hits the threshold of what I consider, you know, 99% of people to need in terms of quality. As an example, if you shoot drones, uh, if you use the Mavic Pro series or the Mavic Air series, that one inch sensor is this sensor, except this has got a much better lens on it. And so the quality of images you'll get from this device is better than even those. Now, the second kind of thing that I love about these cameras is that you can literally bring it everywhere. I permanently keep this in my drink pocket on, the, on my backpack so that I can quickly pull it out when I need to. And I never leave the house without it and I never miss a shot because I have this on me at all times. And I think that, especially when you get further into your photography journey, you start to really treasure size and space and portability and really start to consider, you know, if you're bringing all of these lenses in your bag, you've suddenly got a 10 kilo backpack. And if you're going hiking, for example, it does get a little bit tedious to bring along. Whereas you bring one of these and you're set, you're, you're totally sweet and this weighs just as much as your smartphone really. Another reason is that these devices generally have fixed lenses on them. So you don't actually need to buy anything else. You don't need to buy a separate body. You don't need to buy a separate lens that goes on that body. Usually these compact cameras have a very big range of focal length that you can shoot with. And so that gives you a lot of versatility to be able to capture all different styles of photography. And then one last thing I'll say about them is that they last a long time. You can buy one and you'll keep it for many, many years and you'll 
accent it with the rest of your kit that you end up building on top of that. So for me, for example, I always have this in my kit with all of my other bodies that I might decide to bring along with me on any photography journey. And so you will have this longevity with the singular purchase. And I think that's really important as well. Now, the next suggestion that I'll give you guys, if you've got just a little bit more money and you wanna splash a little bit more cash into this particular journey of yours, then I would actually recommend that you go for a secondhand full frame camera. Now, this is somewhat, I guess, unconventional advice, uh, jumping straight up into full frame. But there's three main reasons that I would suggest this route and have been suggesting this route for many years. Now, the first reason is APS-C versus full frame sensor sizes. Now, APS-C is the kind of smaller sensor size and full frame is obviously, well, the full frame. The, the very similar to the 35 millimeter film kind of size that we used to use in the old film days. Now, the differences between the two in practical terms means that full frame, the full frame sensor, because it's larger, it's able to gather more light because it's physically bigger. So there's more photosites is what it's called. And so more light can hit that, meaning that the sensor doesn't need to turn up the gain or turn up the ISO or just work as hard in order to capture the same amount of light as the smaller sensor. Now, the second reason is that secondhand prices across most manufacturers are usually not too different between APS-C and full frame. You're only ever saving, you know, a couple hundred bucks at most. So you might as well just go for full frame straight away and all the benefits that it provides, if you can find a good deal, of course. And the third, and in my opinion, probably the most important factor to buy a full frame, a secondhand full frame first, is the lens mount selection. So basically with lenses, Lenses versus bodies, you typically get more of a performance benefit in terms of sharpness, in terms of resolution, in terms of clarity. And by resolution, I mean how well an image resolves, how much detail you get in that image. You'll probably get more of a benefit in investing in lenses than in bodies. So essentially what you wanna be doing is you wanna pick a lens mount and stick with that for many, many, many years, your entire photography journey even. And then within that, you can change bodies and you know, sw swap things out and all those kind of things. But lenses typically have a much longer life in your arsenal of gear than bodies do. And so sticking with the same lens mount to start with, with the correct lens mount to start with, is often a good idea because then you don't need to sell all your lenses and move to a different system, or you can just continually build on the things that you have already and start to build a stockpile of your favorite lenses based on character or lenses based on utility and all those kinds of different things. Another thing to consider is that the APS-C lenses, the APS-C mounts don't really work on full frame bodies. You tend to get a cut in version of what could potentially be, you know, the full frame of that sensor. Whereas the inverse works. So if you buy a full frame lens and put it on an APS-C sized body, that will work and that will work really well. I do that with some of my other older bodies as well. And so the idea of sticking to a lens mount and just getting lenses in that one particular mount that works across the entire range of things, of bodies and of sizes, is a smart idea so that you don't have to spend extra money down the road. And for the last suggestion when it comes to bodies, if you've got too much money and you just wanna go all in, you wanna go ham, then get a new full frame entry level camera. So for example, you know, every single manufacturer will have a baseline full frame model. So for Sony, it's the A7 III series of cameras or it's the A7C series of cameras. They're both the same sensor with different like kind of body sizes. So one of the reasons why I suggest the baseline model of the full frame series is so that you can understand what requirements you have of future bodies. So for example, the A7R, R for resolution series for Sony, is the very highly detailed, very high megapixel count series of bodies. And you know, a lot of landscape photographers use that kind of body. And if you want the best of the best image quality, you go for that style of body. 
Conversely, if you are, say, an astrophotographer and you want maximum light sensitivity with low noise, or maybe you're a video creator or you want a little bit more of a hybrid device, then you might want to go for the A7S series, which is S stands for sensitivity, which gives you a little bit more of an advantage when it comes to the low light performance of your images. Alternatively, if you shoot sports or you just want the best of the best, perhaps maybe you'll get an A9 or an A1 uh, with the insane amount of burst speed and the electronic shutter and all those kind of things that you might find that you need over time. But all in all, a baseline full frame camera will allow you the space and the latitude to be able to figure out exactly which further future camera you would want to go for. All right, let's talk lenses now. And lenses can be a little bit confusing because there's a whole bunch of different numbers and configurations, zooms, primes, and a whole bunch of different things that can be a little bit daunting to start with. But before we dive into the suggestions, if you haven't checked out my video on a tier list of what I consider to be the best lenses that I've tried, and I've tried dozens of different lenses, where I rank all of these different ones from S rank to C rank, so from best to worst, then check out the link in the description below. For this particular video, I'm going to be giving you some broad suggestions, and you know maybe these suggestions are based on style or budget, but they will be most accessible to least accessible. So the very first suggestion is one that everyone suggests. It is the good old 24 to 70. The 24 to 70 is pretty much the one lens that does all the things. And it comes in generally two configurations across the board. Doesn't matter what manufacturer you use, doesn't matter what mount you use, typically it's going to be either in an F4 configuration or an F2.8 configuration. And these are the aperture numbers that I'm talking about. The F4 version is your normal version and typically the cheaper of the bunch. You'll get really good performance out of your 2470 f4 lens and so if you're budget conscious or space conscious and you only want to have one lens then that lens is a good place to start if you are then going for say a 2470 f2.8 usually the 2.8 models are the more pro level models and by pro level i mean they have better resolution they have better clarity they have better sharpness they usually have weather sealing but at the same time, they're also heavier, they're also bigger, and they're also way more expensive. So it depends on what your needs are, but those kind of ranges are what you'd uh, typically expect when you're looking for a 2470. Also, something else to consider is the 24 to 105, which is also a very common focal range when it comes to zooms. That usually comes in an F4 as well. So that's also super versatile. And instead of the you know, the upper barrier being 70, it's 105, so you get that little bit of an extra reach, which is kind of nice. From there, things start to get a little bit interesting. From there, I would recommend perhaps if you are space conscious, you're budget conscious, you don't want to buy too many lenses, then I would recommend a 70 to 200. A 70 to 200 is a big guy. <laughs> it's, it's one of these big uh, white lenses. Uh, but the F4 versions of those lenses are typically a lot smaller, a lot lighter, a lot cheaper, and still get amazing results. And so I would recommend that as potentially your next purchase, also because at that kind of focal range, this zoom is coming out of the boundaries of what your eye, your human eye sees in everyday life. And when you get into compositions that are, you know, in excess of 150, 200 millimeters, things start to compress in your image. The you know, elements in your background starts to get smooshed together, which you can't actually replicate unless you see that in camera. Uh, and it's just something that you, you kind of have to learn to, to see in the wild or imagine before you take your composition. But my point is that this is the kind of range that starts to get interesting because the human eye doesn't see these compositions typically. The same is true with the 1635 millimeter zoom lens as well. The 1635 tends to get into the range where it's quite difficult to imagine your composition ahead of time and it takes a little bit of practice. 
because it's not something that the human eye normally sees. And that's where you start to get interesting results with your photography. Now, the three lenses that I mentioned, the 1635, the 2470, and the 7200, all three of these lenses are what's called the holy trinity of zoom lenses. You'll find that people who, let's say, want to save space in their bag and want the most versatility and the most utility, get these three lenses typically because you have the entire spectrum all the way from 16 all the way up into 200 that you can shoot with, which is really nice. In addition to that, you only need to bring three lenses, which is kind of cool as well. What I would recommend is that for most people, you endeavor to get something like this so that you have experience with all of these different focal lengths and have experience with using these focal lengths with the style and the category of photography that you're doing because some of these focal ranges are better than others for different types of photography. So for example, landscapes are typically shot very wide. So a 1635 is a landscape photographer's best friend. A portrait photographer, for example, might want to gravitate towards a 24 to 70 or a 70 to 200 because portraits are typically shot between 35-ish to maybe 105, 135, depending if you're doing you know, corporate headshots or what have you. But the point here is that different styles of photography generally gravitate to different focal lengths and different focal ranges. And it's only in the experimentation and the understanding of these different lengths that suit your style specifically that you should then go into, well, in my opinion anyway, that you should then go into primes. So prime lenses are lenses that are stuck to one particular focal length. But the advantage of these primes is that they are generally smaller, cheaper, sharper, faster. But again, the disadvantage is that they're stuck to the one focal length. But if you know that say you are a portrait photographer and you love shooting contextual portraits at 35 millimeters, then getting a 35 millimeter f1.4 lens would be absolutely perfect for you. It's in knowing these go-to focal lengths that you can start to really hone in the identity of your photography and benefit from the other things that you get from primes as well. So when it comes to quality in terms of pricing and budget and accessibility for primes, there are different classes as well. Typically you might get like an F2.8, which is like the average quality of a prime, so a 35 millimeter F2.8, or you might get a F1.8, which is you know, quite a lot better. And then the pro level is usually F 1.4 or F 1.2. Now all of these go up in both quality and price at the same time. Uh, but yeah, in the upper end, you're looking at more sharpness, more detail, more resolution and all those kind of neat things. Now, as for what you're aiming for, you know, having all primes or having all zooms or having mixes of both, I mean, it's up to you. There really is no right or wrong way about it. Everyone has different needs. Everyone has different styles. Everyone has different categories of photography that they're shooting. And so one answer isn't going to be right for everyone. Just mix and match, experiment a lot and borrow lenses if you need to as well, just to get a feel for them. All right, I think that's it for this video. But before we end it, I do want to say that, you know, your gear ultimately, it doesn't matter that much, right? You are going to spend a little bit of time, you know, make the right choices, make the right mount choices and do your due diligence with the gear. But 80% of the time, and this is why I don't actually spend that much time making gear related videos on my channel is that most of the time the gear doesn't actually matter as much as you think it does. You know, everything else, the composition, the vision, the story you're trying to tell, these are the things that actually matter when it comes to improving your photography. Sure, the gear matters when it actually does matter, when you do need that little bit more low light performance, when you do need that little bit more shallow depth of field because you're trying to go for a specific dreamy effect or what have you. But the majority of the time, it's going to be your vision. It's going to be the way you compose an image. It's going to be you know, the way you approach and think about shooting photography. These are the things that are more important. So remember that when you're going into how much time you decide to spend researching on all of this fabulous gear. All right, that's it for this video. I will see you in the next one, but until then, get out there and make something that matters. Peace.